Uh, the book itself, just a brief account of the, of the story of the book. The book is basically about a 10 year period of our lives. We, I'm Irish, as you might have guessed. <laughs> My wife's a New Zealander. Um, we went to New Zealand in uh, 1989. And in 1999, uh, I said to my wife one day, I said, I'm not staying here anymore. I'm going back to Europe. I cannot stand New Zealand. It was too isolated for me. I said, if I stay here anymore, you'll find me hanging off a tree one day. <laughs> so I said, it's entirely up to you. You can come or stay. So we arrived in boulogne sur mer in northern France without any money and no French in 1999. And I busked on the street with a harmonica and a dog to earn our living. And basically, the book is a story of how we went from rags to riches. <laughs> no, how we went from, you know, living uh, rough in northern France. And you'll read the book. We moved around quite a lot in different houses. <coughs> Two Suitcases and the Dog is not about coming to Provence and buying a 3 million euro house, spending summer visiting vineyards and eating out in expensive restaurants and complaining about the tradesmen. No. This is the tradesman speaking about his real life drama of arriving in France from New Zealand without a word of language and virtually penniless. It's about being declared homeless by the French government and all because of his love for the dog which he refused to put into quarantine, thus exiling himself and his New Zealand wife until they sm either smuggle the dog into Britain or wait for the dog to die. Other than a free meal on their first night in France, they did not eat out again for four years because of their poverty line existence. Read how they work both the system on their way to Provence and how they now live next door to Pierre Cardin and what can only be described as an idyllic abode in the, the Coste Louvre. My Cohen has been through the mill and has felt the weight of the stone on occasion, but never despair or give up. Let him now guide you to a nightmare which became a dream. Uh, everything that we, 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 we eat in this house is uh, organic, AB, agriculture, biologic. So we're strict vegetarians. We didn't become vegetarian because we disliked the taste of meat or chicken or fish. We like, we like it, like everybody else. We chose this as a philosophy of life that we weren't going to put ourselves beyond nature, above the animal world. And we took that philosophy not only in our own personal eating habits, we took it into our life in general, into the gardening. Our gardening company is totally green, organic. We don't use any herbicides, pesticides, or fungicides. Uh, I did say earlier I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I like the philosophy of Buddhism. Um, I've been to India to to uh, to feel and to be amongst Buddhists, um, and uh, my whole philosophy of life centers around the whole Buddhist ethic. And, uh, and that is, we spoke earlier of our vegetarianism, our relationship to, to nature, to, to the animals. Okay, we're just going to talk uh, briefly about Pierre Cardin, uh, Monsieur Pierre Cardin, the French uh, fashion designer. Uh, he lives here on the coast and bought the Chateau de Sade in the year 2001. Uh, Monsieur Cardin has. Uh, some 250,000 people working for him around the world. And he started what became the worldwide uh, fa fashion, um, the, fa the fashion of the future was uh, prêt à porter, French word means ready to wear, prêt à porter. It's just pre cut clothing on the high streets and uh, suits, dresses, shirts, everything like that. That was an incredible, daring thing. That was a very, very socialist thing to do, you know. And uh, he, he got a lot of uh, opposition from that, um, from, from, from the uh, operations of society in, 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 in the shopping world. A lot of people don't understand Pierre Cardin because they don't know the man personally. And I think that is a tragedy because uh, this is a, a living legend, a pure gentleman, a very, very humble man, and, um, and a philanthropist, you know. Uh, he's, uh, he seems to be a 24-hour man, he doesn't do siesta, he works seven days a week, and uh, he just, he defies gravity, he defies logic, he defies everything. So, we're, we're very lucky to, to be in the same 
universe, as I this village was abandoned in, after the Second World War and uh, a lot of the houses have been in disrepair ever since. A lot of ruins, which is unusual for the year 2008-9, still ruins in the village. So Mr. Cardan came and he's bought up uh, all the ruins and he's pouring money into the village and creating an incredible amount of work for local people and um, <coughs> local suppliers. And, uh, and we're going to have a very rich cultural inheritance here because he's proposing to make it a, an art centre, which is very symbiotic with the American College. And uh, good for the region, good for the patrimoine, which is what they say in French. So we're very fortunate. He's a philanthropist. As you all know, the greatest philanthropist of all times, Joseph Carnegie, and Carnegie said that a man that dies rich dies in sin and uh, Pierre Cardin is, is a very wealthy man for sure and uh, there's no, he doesn't need to be up here renovating villages he's 86 he could be lying on the beach in Saint-Tropez but no he chooses not to do that he puts his money to good use not only here in the coast but in various other places around the world and um, we're very thankful to him for that all Pierre Cardin's property from here all the way up to the church is belong to Pierre Cardin. Everything has been restored. Roofing, everything. There's been millions poured into this village. It is the talk of France. It's now becoming topical even outside the country. It's phenomenal. And people should be uh, applauding it. interviewed last year by an American art, by an American journalist and she said that she's bought a bottle of champagne and she's waiting for the day for someone to ring her up to tell her that Pierre Cardin is dead so that she can celebrate. That's, that's the mentality of some of these so-called socialists in Lacoste as regards Pierre Cardin's philanthropy. I mean not all the villagers are like that about him, no, but, but uh, quite a few. Um, they started a, a campaign here two years ago to stop his projects. They failed, of course, and, uh, and rightly so, and obviously, well, no, why, should they, why should they succeed? You know, he's not doing anything wrong. He's buying property. And um, some of the people that have sold properties to Pierre Cardin have been classed as traitors by the ones that were opposed to him. It's village politics, and uh, not only is it village politics, it's quite a predominant attitude here in Provence. The Provençals are like that, but the Provençals treat everybody outside of Provence as foreigners anyway. So Pierre Cardin isn't French at all. You know, he's been in France an eternity, longer mm -hmm. than anybody. He left Italy when he was a young boy. And he's been in France perhaps about 80 plus years, wow. yet he's still seen as a, a blow-in, you know? <laughs> well, yes, initially there were, he was accosted on the street uh, frequently, um, and uh, which is why I went on live television uh, two years ago on TF1, the French channel, mm -hmm. and defended Pierre Cardin. And uh, during the interview, there was people on the street shouting at me, telling me to get out of Lacoste. You know, but what right had I? I was not a Lacoste. On the inside of the book, dedications, not to my wife, who said that it would never be published, and if it was, its only purpose would be for leveling tables. So there you go. So my book has been published, and it's doing very well. And I think my wife regrets what she said. Up from ancient ruins in Phoenix flight, domain the sad appeared before my very eyes. Stone by stone, his titan feet rose and rose beyond a dream where lark and passing cloud can meet. Now a beacon 
On this once lacosted hill has far off Bonnie put the shame and soon the moon it will. Okay, this isn't very easy for me. This is her... Um, the book I published is called Two Suitcases and a Dog and uh, there's a photograph of the dog on the cover which you've seen early on. His name was Bono Bono. Uh, he was six years of age. And um, I've been very uh, vocal in the village uh, in my support of uh, Monsieur Cardin and uh, I've received a lot of um, obscene phone calls, um, even a death threat, believe it or not. I've had my windows smashed, I've had my car scroll, scraped, I've had the taillights of my van broken. And I was rather anticipating that something sinister was going to happen. Uh, and uh, two, this book was published two months before the dog died. I had already written in the book that I was anticipating the dog's death. And we had no doubt that the dog was, um, that it wasn't an accident. Okay. And I came up here and I found my wife holding the dog, dripping with water after she'd pulled it out of the pond. The dog's teeth were, were, were bloody and his nails were all bloody. He'd been in there, I don't know how long, could have been in there all night, swimming, 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 trying to get out. This is a very, very xenophobic part of the world and, uh, and the Provençals are very parochial um, and Lacoste is a very, very socialist, mini-minded village, anti-foreigners, uh, uh, anti-capitalist, um, and uh, I'm definitely anti-me, a worker for defending uh, what they would see as a capitalist. I have no intention of letting this incident lie and uh, I will pursue it. I'll write about it and I want to expose Lacoste for what it really is. I expect that I will have uh, more happen to me. I don't know what's going, what they're going to do next because uh, these are very, very devious, uh, mafioso-type people and, uh, and cowardly people. Napoleon said he never had a soldier from Provence. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm still, I've still a lot of anger in me. Uh, I've still a lot of emotion in me. And uh, anyone in the village will know that the dog was with me 24 hours a day in the van at work. You know, he slept on the bed, he did everything. He was, he was our dog. The last night of the dog's life is still very, very much in my mind. I saw him on the couch looking at me because it was time for his night pee-pee. Uh, everyone knew he was out at the same time every night, which is why I believe that he was uh, abducted. And, um, and it was I let him out. I don't know whether I could call it a fond memory or a tormented memory, but there's confusion at the moment as to which it is. I, I, I think that dogs have a... I think that's just the way that dogs have the relationship with us as much as we have it with them. I don't know who discovered that the domestication uh, should happen, whether it was the dogs or us. Perhaps it was the dogs. They domesticated us, I think. You tell them from me that they're dealing with the wrong man, okay? Because I'm prepared to die for this. Okay? I hope they are also. My dog drowned a couple of weeks back. And last night, for the first time since it happened, I had a dream which woke me up. It was bordering on a nightmare, perhaps not quite, but it was certainly a, a very vivid dream. 
vivid enough for me to actually hear the sound of the dogs barking. And uh, I remember in the dream looking for the dog and I can remember a lot of other noise masking out the dogs barking. And uh, eventually I, I found the direction it came from and I, and I looked up this little avenue and here was Bono Bono, my dog, running down to meet me. Um, and his front paws were all mud. He'd obviously been in a marsh or something like that, which was obviously symbolism of where he was actually found. He was found inside in a, a dirty old pond and he was all dirt and smelt from, from the water that was actually stagnant. So perhaps, you know, I, I felt cheated up until now that my grief hasn't been emancipated and um, maybe that last night's dream was the um, emancipation of, of all the anxiety I've had since the dog died. I, I felt somewhat relieved this morning and um, maybe, maybe it's just some psychological way of dealing with it that I couldn't deal with it in my conscious state I failed to deal with it and uh, you know, I just feel as though that I have come to some acceptance of the dog's death finally and it was a very nice parting of us very difficult time. It was very difficult for me to come to terms with the dog dying because of how the dog died. So last night was it helped me a bit perhaps. I think we need to cry to get rid of grief, you know, and I think I don't think if we don't do enough of it. It's, uh, it's it stays within us like a like a poison wound, you know. We have tear ducts for a reason, and uh, unlike crocodiles, black swan flapping, frantic skipping, and toe tapping, testing, tasting wind beneath unfurling feathers, hitting, whipping, splashing, hoping, others looking, mocking, joking, out of breath. Choking, choking, thought provoking, gaggling, hissing, panting, missing, escaping, not so easy as lake waters chop on each gigantic stroke. Wet then magnifies those spanning tips like downward suction, teeth on lips or dipping bows of steaming ships, resisting, persisting, aging, fading, gravity engaging, fearing, despairing, deciding, gliding, no more nesting, resting, unwantingly alone. And I think people who suffer from depression get into this state of, of meditation that takes them out of the normal run of life. And it's here, it's here they find their true art and their true skill. The list is an enormous amount of people. Who've had um, who've had this problem in their life? Personally, I've had severe depression all of, all of my life, and uh, it wasn't until I went to the AA I met an American guy called Bill. I can't tell you his second name, but uh, he's my sponsor, and um, he he got me into the AA, and and uh, I'm nine years in the AA now. This this 28th of April is my ninth anniversary, which is only eight days away. And I'll be doing a story. And uh, it's not a case of just having not drank for the nine years. It's a case of having allowed the light into my life. As you can see, I've probably got one of the most well, best lit houses in Lacoste. There's no curtains on the windows. There's no shutters. And um, it's a very bright house. 
and uh, I had to challenge uh, that aspect of my life and um, and become aware that uh, you, we can't hide away behind the shutters and the curtains that we've got to get out and face reality. Um, it's often n not that easy, but <clears throat> my sponsor said to me one time, Bill, he gave me a great bit of advice, and I, and I always listened to it, and I always heeded it, and it's always worked. He said, feel the pain, but do it anyway. <laughs> This is the book launch. Uh, Friday, April the 10th. At 5 o'clock. In the presence of Pierre Cadan, I'm launching my book in Cafe de Sade. Two suitcases and a dog. What's your name? Yeah. Kim. Kim. K I M. K I M. Okay. It's the first fr French sale I've made. Let me tell you something. My brother owns a loss adjusting company, it's an insurance company. Yeah. And he's decided to underwrite the book. So if you're not happy with it, you can get your money back. But there's only one condition you've got to burn your house. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, is the dog still around? Uh, no, it's une amie qui a fait les mêmes études qu'elle. Et il a fait des words. He kept his words. True businessman. Okay. Despite his age, despite his pressures of life, despite his perhaps kidneys, he came, went to the toilet, and he'll be back any minute. What I like is a friendly, he's a very nice man and he represents his very nice country. And uh, she was always say the good thing for every people and uh, never say nefast for uh, for every construction, for everything what you do. That is very rare with the people. They're very happy and to receive the foreign people with very, very welcome and help in the same time. He's a very special good man. Why is he special? Because he's uh, friendly immediately. He don't think he's friendly and like the people for every nationality, every political, every religion, not, not sense the uh, protection for uh, what he is himself. He's a good writer too, and sometimes he, he likes to make a pleasure to any people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, the grave of uh, Bono Bono, my dog, who was found drowned on the 10th of March. Bono Bono was a character, Bono Bono, was a Sardian dog. He was um, he was a non-conformist. He was untrainable. Uh, we took him to an obedience school, and the um, the uh, person who was looking after the dogs there rang us up after two days and said, "You better come and collect your dogs. There's nothing we can do with him. You know, he's uh, he's bizarre." And there's a sign outside the front of our house called uh, it says "Shen Bazaar." Now, bizarre isn't a very um, derogatory word about anybody or anything, it just was, he was a strange dog and um, <clears throat> I come up every day and I, <clears throat> I take a walk around the 
grounds and uh, I was very fond of this dog, he was only six years of age and um, he was still behaving like a, like a pup. An Irish eye on Provence is rather interesting that both of us have only got one eye fully focused. The other one seems to be diffused slightly. Well, yes, I mean, I, I'm very close to, to the earth uh, being a gardener and, I, I, and recycling and everything like that. Um, so it is rather nice, really, to being uh, of a sort of a Buddhist philosophy of the regeneration of life and uh, that, that is not to be feared, as some people do. And we put him under the tree here, just like where Buddha would be sitting. Uh, Buddha apparently sat under the tree for seven years, trying to um, trying to assess uh, the meaning of life. Um, Bono's, you know, down here, and we're we now understanding the meaning of death is perhaps the way of looking at it. So, uh, it, yeah, it is. Um, it's a it's a gardener's dream, I suppose, to, to decompose. <laughs> the, way I, the way I see it is that, um, you know, people have been trying to explain the meaning of the universe and the meaning of uh, life and death for centuries and centuries and centuries, and no one's actually achieved anything different on the subject and um, you know it is basically fear based most people are looking for an answer and of course the answer has to be above ground for most people you know they have to find an, an above ground answer um, to to death rather than to life but really I think they should be looking at life rather than death because it's happening all, all around all around us and the answer isn't above ground, it's below ground. And uh, you know, what, what happens in, in springtime should, should reassure everybody that once a year everything comes back to life again. And um, you know, being a gardener and, and, and looking after the ground, not using herbicides, pesticides or fungicides, recycling carefully, you know, compost composting and all that sort of thing you know I think gardeners don't have the same fear of farmers perhaps you know real farmers I'm not talking about chemical farmers um, don't have this fear of death because they're not out there killing things you know they're out there nurturing things and you only need to meet them once you meet them you'll understand you can see it in them they've got a different philosophy they think differently they're not worried about death why is that you know there's a Chinese philosophy, it says, if you want to be happy for one hour, have a drink. If you want to be happy for one year, get married. If you want to be happy for a lifetime, become a gardener. <laughs>